to live a healthy life. Yeah, yeah. Where does she get her information from? Do you do you watch TV Your with children. her? And you're not wearing a mask at home. All of these things that we find in African Americans increase your susceptibility to getting the virus, especially this more contagious Delta virus. Right now, in hospitals throughout the country, but most certainly in the South, what happens if it's positive? You need to ask those questions. What made you come? Um, I came because I wanted to get vaccinated so me and my family won't have COVID. Hey, this is Dr. Lenora Coleman. Um, I want to uh, welcome you to our, our program. Uh, this is new. This is our first inaugural episode here of For Your Health. And we're going to be over the next uh, year, the next several months, um, coming to you on Saturdays. 12.30 to 1.30, talking about topics that are hot topics. And we're going to be spotlighting some of the amazing clinical pharmacists that we have uh, throughout this country. Um, I uh, am Dr. Lenore Coleman, president and founder of Healing Our Village. I'm a pharmacist by training and a certified diabetes educator. And I have the unique pleasure and honor to be working with a number of um, historically black colleges and universities and schools of pharmacies across the country. And there are a million pharmacists out here working every day who sh are your resource for information about your medications. I, we're not using our biggest resource. And so it's really important that I, you all know what these pharmacists know so that we can be able to, to, to talk to them and ask them the right questions, et cetera. So this is our inaugural show, and we're going to be talking about COVID-19. I figured I'd spend two or three Saturdays talking about that because it, that's on everybody's mind. And for our show today, we're going to be talking to Dr. Kevin Sneed. Kevin Sneed is actually the dean at the University of South Florida. Uh, he's coming to us live today um, from an unknown location. <laughs> Isn't that what they say? <laughs> he's coming to us from an unknown location, and we're going to talk about COVID-19. Um, a lot of the frequently asked questions that I know people are asking me all the time, and we're going to get um, uh, Kevin to really talk to us about that. But uh, Dr. Dr. Sneed, are you, are you there? Uh, can you, yes, I'm here. Can you hear me okay? I sure can. Thank you so much for taking your time. Your time is valuable, and I really, really am honored that you're uh, on our show here today for For Your Health. Well, it's a very important topic we're talking about. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, listen, I want the audience to know a little bit about you, so introduce yourself, kind of talk to us about your background, because um, I want them to know what an amazing expert you are that we have the honor of having today. Well, first of all, Dr. Comey, you know, I'm, I'm pretty humble, so I'm, I'm going to keep that pretty short. But you, uh, in, in, during your intro, you, you recognize yourself as being a pharmacist. I am a, as well. And even though I'm the dean of the University of South Florida, Tunisia College of Pharmacy, I, I have maintained a very robust uh, clinical practice, primarily focused on uh, metabolic syndrome. And so you and I share a passion for diabetes and, and hypertension. Uh, but I also have a, a very extensive background in, in infectious disease, and, and uh, prior to going to pharmacy school, I was also going down the pathway of getting a PhD in immunology. So when COVID-19 really crept in, um, I was able to very quickly pivot and read up on this thing. And so now I have read over 300 peer-reviewed articles, and I'm currently a co-investigator for a clinical trial here for a COVID vaccine that I'm doing in collaboration with my USF health uh, colleagues. All right. Oh, that's amazing. That's amazing. Yeah, I, you know, that was when we were talking about COVID-19 and you were my, I had attended one of your webinars. I didn't know about the immunology background that you had, which is like, that's unusual for a pharmacist to have yes. that kind of, of a background. So that puts you in a, a very small group of folks who really do understand what's going on with this COVID-19. So we're just going to go through a whole series of questions that come up all the time. I've attended a lot of these webinars and 
I think either the level of the webinar is too high or the level of the webinar is too low. I'm, I'm trying to make sure that we're answering these questions with a lot of specificity so that we can actually understand, you know, and the people that are watching really understand what's going on. Because there's a lot of misinformation, a lot of misconceptions out there. Unfortunately, there's a lot of misinformation, and uh, as you well know, I, I've, I've done probably 30 or 35 uh, community talks where we're trying to undo that misinformation with actual facts, uh, with clinical evidence, uh, clinical trial information, published information, and so on and so forth, at a level that people can understand. So, uh, so yeah, let's, let's have a chat. All right, here we go. So, first question, what is a virus actually, and how is a virus different from a bacteria? Uh, well, let's make sure we try and understand, and this is really difficult for many people to understand, but viruses actually are not truly living beings. In order to qualify as being something that's living, uh, you must have a, a separate nucleus that can divide, and, and viruses do not have that. Uh, bacteria, on the other hand, they do have a, a nucleus that can divide, so they, they can pass their DNA from one thing to the other. Uh, our uh, viruses do not have DNA. It's very important to understand because that will come up in a later question, I'm sure. Now, the other important thing that we must understand is that viruses are designed to interact with components of your body, and then they replicate themselves when they, during that interaction, and then they replicate themselves and then uh, find a way to promulgate or transmit themselves to something else. So. They really are kind of almost like scavengers and parasites. They, they, they infect the body. They, they use your material and your body to replicate themselves, and then they look to pass on to something else. Right, right. And see, so I don't, you're the, this is the first time I've actually had anybody actually say that. All right, so I, that, I think that really is helpful for our, for our audience because as we start talking about vaccines on our next episode, then you, they may understand about this whole idea of messenger RNA and it's a, and it, a carrier and, and the, exactly, and that you have to have a host for a virus. And that's Absolutely. important you must as have well a host. because what I, what I heard to, yesterday, which I thought was interesting um, from one of the medical experts out there, is this mutation that's happening um, yes. It's because the spread is going is so is so far and vast that it's going into different host bodies, which is allowing it to mutate. So it's learning on the way because of the spread. So when Biden says we for a hundred days, everybody in this country needs to wear a mask so we can get this spread down to zero that will also decrease the number of mutations. And I think that that's important. Absolutely. Let me, let me add on to that comment. Um, when viruses, when they get in your body and they begin to use your material to replicate themselves, they also are learning how to adapt to the environment that they're in. So if it hits a particular t uh, type of demographic of people, and it spreads from one person to the other, it is learning how to transmit more, more efficiently among that group. And, and as, it, as it learns, it's going to adjust some of its own proteins to become even more transmissible or more, more likely to be able to live inside of that host. And so when, when we're talking about stopping the spread, we are literally talking about how can we stop the potential for that mutation to occur. Exactly, exactly. All right, so we talked about viruses. Now, what are coronaviruses? Now, coronaviruses, uh, it's a family of viruses. You know, just like we have, and, and the example I give to the public is very easy to understand. We have, uh, just like we had different types of uh, uh, species of dogs, we have different types of species of, of viruses. And so the coronavirus is a type of virus. Uh, most importantly, um, uh, the coronavirus, if you if you were to look at it under a fluorescence, it seems to have like the corona of the flames coming coming off of the sun, and so that's how it got its name, yeah. and that's what those little spike proteins are. Uh, but just like you have a, you, know, you might have a, a cocker spaniel, you, know, you might have a German shepherd, uh, you might have a pit bull. Uh, we have you know coronaviruses, we have HIV viruses, we have influenza viruses. They're all different families of viruses. And right now we're dealing with the pandemic and spread of the coronavirus family. Right. All right. So um, I guess we've had about three, three or so coronaviruses that 
that we, we know really actually got a foothold in terms of infectious disease in, in, our, in our country, and that was SARS, MERS, and now this one. So this is sort of SARS COVID-2, there was a SARS COVID-1, um, and then there was MERS, okay? So these, oh, they, when people talk about these, there's a lot of information out there about this came from an animal and it jumped species, and that's uh, not the, uh, the usual case with viruses, um, and it came from bats in a wet market. What, what, what's your take on this? Because I know you've been reading a lot about what they think in terms of origin. Yeah, the one thing I can tell you about the origin, we've been able to take this particular SARS-CoV-2, and they have done the uh, complete genetic sequence of this particular virus, and we've done what I refer to, what people can commonly understand as being the Ancestry.com of the virus. So we know exactly what animals it has been in. We know exactly where some of the mutation points have occurred historically over time. And so the one thing that we were looking for is to uh, see if we could determine if there was any human intervention that may have actually led to something like the way of bioterrorism. Uh, was there anything that possibly led to an experiment that went bad? And so far, we can, uh, what we can detect is the fact that we don't think any of that occurred. We understand exactly where it came from. And these viruses do live in bats. And, and bats, especially in the Asian regions, are harbingers of a lot of different types of viruses, which is why we have uh, virus hunters out there looking for it. And they, and they go to bats and they swab bats and they look to see it, what, whatever type of virus is there. Now, it doesn't mean that it will automatically jump over the human, but when we find ones that can, they're called zoonotic uh, transmission. And so, yes, this particular one has shown the capability of doing that. Right, right. So that's a new word for us, zoonotic transmission, right? So, and, but you also hit something that I want to say out loud again. So there are scientists all over the world that are studying this virus, folks, and they are looking at transmission. And this idea that this was developed in a lab, it was a bioterrorist type of, of thing, that, that, that they can actually know if that is true. And as far as we know so far, that is not true. So that's a huge myth out there that I wanted to dispel today. So thank you so much for, for, for bringing that up. So then I guess the next question is, as we're trying to prevent the spread of COVID-19, I guess let's talk a little bit about the masks. A lot of people, you know, which mask do I get? Do I, can I buy one from the Dollar Tree? Does it matter? Um, do they need to be two-ply, one-ply? Um, do I really need to use an N95 or the surgical mask that they use at the dentist? So what, which mask do you think, uh, what, what is your take on that? Uh, well, we've been fortunate here in the state of Florida to actually have a number of people that have done a lot of experiments with a lot of different types of masks. And so I've been paying attention, uh, and this information, by the way, is even published by the New England Journal of Medicine. Uh, the recommendation is to have a, at least a three-ply mask. And so when people were making their own homemade mask, that was a recommendation that you could use even cotton, but it, had, it needed to be three-ply in nature at the very least. Uh, now, number one, Okay. okay. Um, go ahead. I'm sorry. Okay. And now, I think it's very important just, uh, just for, for our, all of our viewers. Uh, you see a lot of people that wear what we call these gaiters. It's like a, a very thin thing that you can wear, you can pull over your head and, and you put over your nose and, and just pull it up. That has been determined not to be effective to prevent transmission from the individual. Okay. And now, I think it's very... James, stop messing around. I... Okay, go ahead. Uh, yeah, the, ga the gators are not, they are not effective. However, some of the gators actually have a little insert where you can put a filter, okay? And, and, and these filters can be purchased online on, on eBay or, or Amazon.com or in your local store. And then the very last thing you mentioned, some of the masks are not all masks are, e are created equal. So you need to make sure that if you could actually take your finger, a wet finger, and rub it across and have some of the cotton rub off on your finger, that's probably not one of the safer masks that you want to wear because we don't want the fibers from the mask being inhaled by the individual. So we need a good quality mask. If you wet your finger and rub it across the inside of the mask that will be against your nose, then you should be able to uh, determine if you have a good mask or not. 
I got it. All right. So I, so I hope the audience heard that, right? So um, the, I, what I heard from you saying is the gators are not good, that not it needs good. to be three-ply. Um, whatever you're purchasing, you need to have some description on the packaging telling you what, what you're buying. Um, cotton seems to be good. If you're going to make a homemade yeah. one, um, they actually had a way for you to put sort of a, uh, had a little slit in it so that you could put that third layer in there and remove it. Yeah. All right. So I think that that's important. So, so tell me, do, do you agree that everyone should use a mask? I, I do. Mm -hmm. uh, there are certain people with certain conditions that probably have challenges with the mask. Um, but there are very, very few people that have that. And I think well over 99% of our community here in this country should be wearing a mask. Okay. All right. And if we did that, it would decrease the spread. It would decrease the spread from the individual and it can protect you from actually inhaling because this particular coronavirus, it's not a true what we call airborne, but it is aerosolized. And it can't. And if you're in an, an internal environment, it can be in the atmosphere for hours. So so um, we have to really be careful about that but um but it can that, that that mask can prevent you from inhaling it and if you happen to have it it can prevent you from giving it to, giving it to other people okay so that's relatively new information because i know that i've heard uh folks ask that question and that's the first time that i heard the difference between airborne droplets and aerosolized you know, so for, yeah. you know, lay people, you don't know that there's a difference between <laughs> those two things. So I've been thinking that this is this is this virus that's sitting on a droplet. And when you cough or sneeze or talk loud, that this saliva comes out of your mouth and this virus is sitting on that droplet that that then that's why you have to be six feet apart. So the droplet can fall to the ground. I mean, I had this whole elaborate <laughs> figured out yeah. here but that's not that's the, but now you've actually explained to me why the whole thing with restaurants right because if you're saying that that's it's aerosolized so it can be in the air for you know a half an hour an hour we don't know how long then that's why a change in the ventilation system on a plane or a restaurant or in a school building could theoretically help with transmission. You are exactly right. And, and, and just to be very, very clear, um, and let's talk about when we go back to the virus, if you pull a single hair out of your head, you could actually line up 1,000 viruses across the diameter of your strand of hair. So when we're talking about uh, just uh, the, the mist and, and, and you know, from people coming when they're talking or singing out loud. Those viruses can exist on these very, very fine particles and it can exist in, in the air. So that's why we say, you know, if you're outside, a lot less problem because it's not airborne. It's not going to carry for miles away. Right. But if you are inside in this poor airflow, poor ventilation, it can exist in that internal environment for, for, for we think up to about an hour or so. Right. And people can inhale that. And, that's, and we found that out, by the way, from uh, church choir. Oh, ah, OK. All right. Which is a that's, lot of churches are still not back in session because, of you know, they haven't been given. The, even though some are meeting anyway, they haven't actually been given official clearance by the right. particular state governor. OK, so this is good. All right. Now, um, if you let's say I, ha I went and I got my test and I was I got COVID-19 positive test. Um, I'm now considered contagious, right? So how long should I stay away from my family? The current recommendation is to be isolated for at least a 10 day period. And um, some people have chosen to continue to expand that out to a 14 day period. Depends on the environment where you are, but, but you know, the CDC recommendation right now is to at least have an isolation period of, for, 10, for at least 10 days. Yeah. The question that I had, um, and you may you may have seen some data on this, does the amount of the viral load make a difference in the level of, of, of contagiousness? Right. So let's say that I'm a hospital worker and I'm getting bombarded with that. So my viral load's going to be higher because I'm, a, I'm, I'm taking care of 
COVID positive patients, as opposed to me who maybe contracted this in a grocery store. So my viral, I'm that, positive, but I'm not, I don't have a heavy viral load. Is that, does that have anything to do with it? That has a great deal to do with it. And as a matter of fact, uh, there have been an enormous amount of studies that have looked at that. And so the higher the, the, higher the viral load, meaning that the higher dose of virus that you get, uh, we have to keep in mind the moment it gets into your body and it begins replicating, if you only have just a really small amount replicating, it's going to take a longer time for it to replicate to the point of getting all throughout your body and damaging your body. But if you started off with a very heavy dose of it and that heavy dose of it begins replicating, it's going to invade your body very quickly. Yes. And, and, and Dr. Coleman, if, you know, before we get off, I just want to make sure we understand. Um, can, well, can I can I expand on that thought for just a please, moment for, please. for your audience? Yeah, see, we're, this is what, how For Your Health is different than all this other stuff that we're seeing out there. We, we, we're getting down to the nitty gritty. We're getting down here in the mud. I want to make sure everybody yeah. gets stuff. So please expand. So the nature, so in a lay term, the nature of what I want people to really think about when you think of this coronavirus, the one that's all over the world right now, those little red spikes, think of it as being like Velcro and that each one of us has a receptor in our body that's all throughout our body. I'll talk about that more in just a moment, that it now attaches on to very, very, uh, uh, in just a very rapid manner. And so now the Velcro has attached onto this receptor in, in, in your nose and it begins to replicate and it spreads into these various receptors. So it's called the ACE2 receptor. Now we can't get into the big discussion about the, the physiology of that receptor, but all of all adults have it. And if you happen to be an individual that has diabetes or high blood pressure or asthma or other chronic conditions, we tend to have a higher expression of this ACE2 receptor that this now coronavirus is now programmed to attach onto like Velcro. So it's very important to understand that we have these um, receptors in our heart. We have them in our intestinal tract. We have them in our kidneys. We have them in various, and they're actually in low, low expression in our lungs, but you have such a, a large surface area in the lung that that's why it affects the lungs. So this virus can infect so many different organ systems in your body and cause so many different problems in the body. And that's part of the problem that we have. You know, I had a family of four. All four of them were infected and each one of the four people had a different symptom and a different body part that was being affected in that in that one household. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. OK. All right. All right. So. All right. So let's talk about symptoms. So there are an array of symptoms that, that people get. So I want to talk about what, which ones you're finding in your practice and, and throughout the literature that seem to be more common than others. And then um, how severe, why are some people have no symptoms or sort of asymptomatic carriers? And then some people have just, you know, a, a, it goes right to the pulmonary disease and have to, they go immediately into a hospital and need to be on a ventilator. Well, so just for, from a symptomatology standpoint, we have to really understand that there's an array of different things that can occur very early on, believe it or not, what kind of tipped us off that there was something unique about this particular virus where the number of people that were having diarrhea symptoms. And so the virus was actually invading the gastrointestinal tract. Mm, okay. But uh, a very common thing is headache. Yes. Uh, some people get the loss of a uh, sense of taste and smell. Mm -hmm. Uh, so now it's attacking your neurological system. Uh, some other people, you know, they wind up getting the traditional body aches, but then once it gets into the lung, now we get that very uh, traditional cough. Mm -hmm. Interestingly enough, one of the symptoms we do not see routinely is sneezing, like with, uh, with the cold virus, with the rhinovirus. We don't, so we don't, we don't see a lot of sneezing with this, but the cough we do see a lot of. Okay. All right. And so now we still do not know and understand exactly why some people range all the way from being asymptomatic. However, many people, and it talks about the health status overall here in our country, many people can, can progress pretty quickly onto the respiratory complications that we find. And that, and it doesn't have to take a long time. And we do also believe that it could be uh, because of the, the, um, the viral load that people get, 
But we're also finding differences in array of people that have just a different immune response. Some people have a very robust immune response and some people just don't have a very good immune response. And we're finding the variability of the immune response of many people right now. Right. So there's a lot of different factors, but the one thing I can tell you is that the virus is looking to exploit anything it can inside your body. Okay. So let's say I've done my 14 days. Um, is, is the recommendation that I should go and get tested to see if I'm negative? Will I clear after 14 days? Or may I not? And if I don't clear, if I'm still positive, then that means I need to quarantine longer? Uh, that's... There are two parts to that answer. It's pretty yes. complicated. Um, the, the one thing I can share with you that uh, we do feel that there are people that are probably still going to test positive beyond that 14 day period. However, the big question has been, are they now shedding more more dead virus and we're detecting that dead virus? Right. So we don't think that beyond that 14 day period, many people are going to remain in the, uh, symptomatic to the point where they can actually spread and transmit the virus. Okay. Um, now, that, now, for other people, they may have progressed on where they have uh, organ damage uh, and they may still be in an environment. And so we still recommend that people you know, get tested as much as you can. But, but it, you know, whether or not you're going to test positive and be symptom CB symptomatic or test negative or not, there's still a lot of unknowns there. But, but by and large, we think after a 14-day period, the virus has probably run its course. Your immune system is probably going to do what it can to uh to to kill the virus and, and then the transmission at that point should uh, diminish okay all right so that's really that's also uh, information that i haven't heard out there um so let's talk about ethnic groups that seem to be being hit hardest by this COVID 19. i have a, a hill in our village primarily has an african-american audience um, and so I, I want to talk about um certain ethnic groups that seem to be hit harder and why um, is what I'd like to, to, to find out. Yeah, what, what's your thoughts on that? So the first thing I'd like to tell your audience, uh, there is nothing unique about us having melanin in our skin that is attracting this particular coronavirus. Uh, we need to dispel that right now. Um, as a matter of fact, there's nothing proven at this point about anything genetic other than uh, there appears to be some a thought about uh, people and their their blood type and and, and their ability to to, uh, to to handle and manage it maybe better than other blood types, but I don't want to go there right now. Mm. But uh, if you are African American, if you are Latino, if you fall into the uh, Native Indian group here in the United States, or what we traditionally call American Indian, the health status of more people actually is such that if you have, as I mentioned before, diabetes, high blood pressure, if you have these chronic conditions. If you become infected, you are much likely, much more likely to have a problem uh, if you become infected than if you uh, don't have those conditions. So we find a higher prevalence of these conditions and these cat in these uh, uh, ethnic categories and, and racial categories. So if you, you know, we have a higher prevalence of diabetes and higher prevalence of high blood pressure. Um, you know, we have a higher prevalence of obesity and, and overweight. Those tend to be a, that's another risk factor for for having a bad outcome. We find that more in ethnic groups and also uh, people in these groups we're talking about are much more likely to be essential workers. Mm -hmm. uh, they're much more likely to be uh, to be exposed and have a higher exposure level because they've been forced to work even in the midst of very uh, widespread outbreaks in the geographical area where they're living. They don't have the capability of isolating and working from home on a computer. Uh, and then the third thing that we find um, is that many of our uh, African American groups, and in particular, our, our Latinx uh, uh, colleagues, uh, they live in congregate living. They're much more likely to have multi generational households, and so now a, a single infected in individual coming into that environment and just talking regularly to everybody else may be aerosolizing that environment and spreading it to more people in that environment, meaning everybody's becoming infected. And we're having a large, large death rate that's occurring right now, unfortunately, and, and it's, it's killing me personally for our uh, Hispanic community out in the uh, uh, Los Angeles area right now. The death rate uh, for Hispanics out there is, is tremendously high for those who have been affected. And we have to look at all of these different factors that I just talked about as potential risk factors 
uh, for for why people are are more affected in these ethnic and racial groups. Right, right, right. And you know what you mentioned mentioned about the um, that ACE two receptor, um, and as we talk about diabetes, um, you know the the data is showing you know as they look back to see who has died. So they're trying to you know now sort that information out. A lot of the folks especially African Americans with diabetes, have actually suffered more severe illness and also have higher, higher death rates, a 50% increase in risk of that um, for those patients. And so as, as what we try to talk about at Healing Our Village is if you haven't gotten COVID yet, it is now time for you to get your blood sugar under control. It is now time to really focus on getting your blood pressure under control, your di your blood sugar under control, um, because we know that diabetes, like you said, you know this this virus affects a, a lot of different organ systems. So does diabetes, and so because of that, it affects your immune system. So we know that people with diabetes have decreased wound healing and when they get infections tend to not get out of the hospital as early as some other folks who don't have diabetes. So getting it under control, if we can do that, and it doesn't take a lot, I can get your blood sugar under control in about three, three to four months. Um, if we can get you there, then if in fact you do get COVID, your chances are better than if your blood sugar is out of control. I agree with that completely. You know, I had a patient. Um, uh, uh, can you hear me? Okay. Okay. Can you hear me? Engineer, James, I can't hear. Can 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 you hear me? Oh, now I can. Yeah. Okay. There we go. We're having okay. our uh, a little technical difficulties, but I got you. Yeah. Yeah, I was I was saying I had a patient that had a um, uh, she falls into what we would call the traditionally obese category. She's uh, been diabetic for over fifteen years. Uh, we have her very well controlled. Uh, she had a, a A1C of, I think, 6.2, 6.3, very well controlled. She became infected. Now, tr in traditional sense, she's the person that probably should have died. Right. But because of everything that she was doing, including exercise and including all the other different components, uh, she went to the hospital and, you know, a month later, she came back and saw me in the clinic. Okay. So and I was so happy story. about that. And that and that's one of the, now that's just one success story. Yeah. But, but but we also have to keep in mind it's not a guarantee. I think your word you said it appropriately and best. Uh, your chances are improved if we can get these conditions under control, because there are people that have none of these conditions that actually do wind up dying. But but their chance of dying is far less. Right. And we find the prevalence far less as well. And when you have these conditions, your your expression you have an overexpression of the ACE2 receptor at that time, by the way. So, so you're exactly right, Dr. Coleman. Yeah. Yeah. So, all right. So right now, um, we've been doing a lot better job of testing for COVID-19. I think that, uh, within the next few months, I see, think that our testing rates will go up. I think our ability to trace and track is going to go up. And I say that because I think there's going to be an, with the new administration, there's going to be an infusion of cash into our public health sector. So our departments of health, which are in every city, will be have more resources to be able to, to test and trace. And certainly it looks like there's going to be an army of vaccinators, they call them, to give out, give out the vaccine. So I guess the question is, let's talk about COVID-19 testing. Um, I, I went and got tested because I just wanted to know. I didn't have any symptoms. And so I was able to, to find somebody that would just, my doctor gave me a test. Um, and so even though I didn't have symptoms, what, what is your take on when to test? Should everybody test? Only test with symptoms? What do you think? Uh, I'm a big fan of more testing. Uh, you know, we have to keep in mind because here, here's the here's the actual legitimate point. An individual that goes for a test at eight o'clock in the morning, if they go hang out at a restaurant that night and they encounter people, other people who are infected, they can become infected that evening. Now, they're going to get their result two days later and it's going to show negative. But now, by the time they got the result after two or three days, they actually are positive. So the test that you do at a particular time is only that snapshot in time. Now, I'm not saying that you have to go in and get tested every day, but you know, more periodic testing. Of, I, I'm, I'm very much in favor of, of, of increased testing, uh, ex especially when you have a when you find an outbreak in a given area. 
Right, right. If we could get to the point where some of these rapid tests were a little bit more accurate, because they're not quite as accurate as the nasal swab, some of them. Um, if we could do get to a point where we had an accurate at-home test, right, then that would, I think that's where we need to be moving to, because um, then restaurant owners could, you know, uh, instead of taking your temperature, which may or may not tell you anything, they could actually, if they wanted you to come into their restaurant, they could have you test, right? They could test right then. It would be rapid. You'd know exactly where people are at. I think that we're going to see the businesses across the country, especially the leisure industry like cruise ships, airplane, um, uh, I think you're going to see more testing requirements before you're allowed on a plane. I have a, a woman that lived that, that I work with, and uh, she left today because she had to, to get to Fort Lauderdale. And they required her to test to get on the plane. Absolutely. I can tell you right now, I think we're getting to a point and, and, and I have to be very careful about how I'm going to say this because I'm under a, a non-disclosure agreement, but there are companies out there that are working on rapid tests as quickly as 90 seconds or even you know, up to a three minute test. And if you get to that point, uh, you can test almost anybody anywhere at any time. And if we can get that sensitivity and specificity up, above the 90 percent, then you can be rest assured that the overwhelming majority of people that come into any environment can be tested very quickly. Uh, we can get a result very quickly. And if they become positive, we know that we can remove them from the rest of everybody very quickly as well. Exactly. Exactly. So um, so I'm, I'm, I'm wondering when we t start talking about um, is it possible to test negative for COVID-19 but still be infected? Do you, the virus has to be present, or is that not necessarily true? Uh, you know, in order to, well, first of all, we have to remember all of our available tests are, are designed to come into contact with the actual virus. So if for any chance, especially with some of our antigen testing, uh, some of the rapid testing that we've seen done, but if, if, if you don't come into contact with it, then the test cannot detect it. So the quality of, of doing a NAIR test, um, right. that's very important. But if an individual has been infected at eight o'clock this morning and they come in tomorrow and they get tested at eight o'clock, 24 hours later, that that virus may not have replicated enough yeah. to be detected at that by that time. Right. So there's a timing issue that is really important. And, and I'm saying this and I've done a lot of work in this area. You know, Dr. Coleman, you may not know this about me as well. I'm on the sports medicine team for the University of South Florida as well. Oh, OK. And I helped to set up and establish the COVID testing for our athletes back in the fall for the football team primarily. Mm -hmm. uh, and, I, and I can share with you that knowing the timing issue, we got to the point of testing these young people every 48 hours. Okay. So they were getting tested. They were getting tested three times a week. Um, and because we understood that those in-between moments can erupt at any moment in time and just doing something one time a week, we did not feel was safe enough because if we tested them on a Monday and didn't test them again until the following Monday and they became infected on Wednesday, they're now transmitting by Saturday and they're hanging out with their teammates uh, through the weekend and now they can infect an entire team because we were only testing one time a week. Right, exactly. And, exactly. I'm, pr and I'm proud to say that by doing that, we had one of the lowest infection rates of any athletic pro program in the entire country. Wow, okay. All right. Yeah. So this testing is so critical. I want to talk about that antigen versus antibody testing and the, spe are they, you know, they're about 50%, I think. I, I know they're working on some that are going to be better, but maybe the differences between that and what if I, I, I had an antibody test. Uh, I, so I had both done and my antibody test, it came back um, uh, unequivocal, right? It, it could, didn't tell me anything, right? Now, I don't have COVID-19 because I've been testing negative since last year, but I'm just wondering, um, for those who have actually had COVID-19, are they going to have antibodies? And, are, and how long will those antibodies last? Do we know that answer? So the, uh, this, particular, this is a very difficult question to answer, but I'm going to answer it very uh, appropriately for our group here. Uh, what we can tell you right now is that for individuals who have been infected, uh, they're, at the very least, we expect they're going to have an antibody response for about at least a three-month period. 
Now it goes back to that viral load you talked about. Right. So because because some people, if you did not have a great deal, or if you didn't have a very robust antibody response to to you know during at your first exposure, you may have developed some antibodies, and you may have gotten over it pretty quick, and it may not it may not affect you that bad, but you may not also have a very robust antibody response either. So we so there could be a chance that there could be a waning of the antibody response after that period of time. Now for Pete, now for the majority of people, once you build those antibodies, we think those antibodies are gonna last for for actually a, a long period of time, you know, probably six to nine months at least. Okay. And the same thing with the vaccine, but I know we'll talk about the vaccine in a moment. However, there is another component of the immune system called T cell immunity, T cell response. And so for people who have been infected with the coronavirus, if you've had a, a pretty good amount of it, even if the quote unquote antibodies do wane, if you were to come into contact with it again, we think that for people that have a, a, a robust immune response, you have these T cells that can come in and kill it pretty quickly. Okay. And so there are a number of people across the country that have this T cell immunity, and that may actually be accounting. We don't know, and I don't want to go on record officially saying it, but my opinion is that may also be another component of the people that, that, that wind up not being as symptomatic when they become infected, even though they have replicating virus and then the, the, the ability to go back and transmit. So there's another component of the immune system that is very important to understand. So, you know, we have antibodies, we have these T cells, we have the genetic component of whether or not you have the capability of forming the, 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 the appropriate amount of antibodies. There's such a variability out there of the immune response that we are trying to get to the point. And by the way, this is why some people we think may become infected more than once. That may, you know, we've had people, you know, well, I became infected. Can I get infected again? Well, there are cases out there now emerging that have been published and studied where people have been infected more than one time. Uh, and right. we're, we're, that's where it's where the strains and the mutants and the mutations and the yes. variants and all of that's coming into play. So it's a very complicated uh, uh, potpourri of, of, of options that we're looking at when, around this particular virus and the pandemic for treatment. Right. So, so that gets me to the next question, which is, um, how do I, I'm, I'm COVID negative. So what, what can I do? And I, and I know it's not a hundred percent foolproof, but what can, can I do to prevent myself from getting COVID-19? What, what, what are the steps? What are the things that you recommend? Uh, well, there's a couple of different things. Number one, and I can tell your audience right now, I I have gotten the full vaccine series. I've been, I've gotten vaccine number one and number two. Okay. I am going to continue to do all the things that we're asking from a public health standpoint. When I go out in public, I'm still wearing a mask. I'm still trying to social distance, and I'm still trying to wash my hands. These are three. These, these public health measures work. Okay. And so, so if you're trying to protect yourself and you have not been affected, we want you to do that. That's number one. Number two, I'm recommending uh, that, that all people, especially our diabetics and hypertensive patients, uh, that they get a baseline vitamin D level right now. Okay. Now, we cannot use vitamin D as a treatment. Uh, I personally don't have any confidence in, in, in these uh, super vitamin regimens as a preventative, like it's going to prevent you from getting effect, infected. You know, because once that virus gets in your nose and attaches on like, like that Velcro I talked about, yes, this particular virus is there and there's not there's not a living amount of vitamin C or anything else that you're going to take that's going to stop that, that, that Velcro attachment into yourself. However, we can build a platform upon which our immune system can build up more, more efficiently. And there are many people that are vitamin D deficient and so when you don't have uh, proper amounts of vitamin D, we're beginning to believe once again that uh, vitamin D is, is a building block for building an immune response. Uh, and there are other components of different things that people can do from a supplemental standpoint to at least uh, boost the immune response should you need it and should you come, uh, come into contact. Yeah. But the public health measures and, 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 and just taking a requisite amount and having, and for people that have a good midline vitamin d level uh probably in the 100 to 200 range on labs and so if you saw the lab range going from 30 up to 400 you'll know what that means um i'm thinking that those people are probably going to be able to to mount a, a good immune response and some of this work actually goes back to the pandemic of 1918 by the way oh, okay 
All right, so that was so what people they back, showed. So, so people back in 1918, and they went back in, and there's still some, some uh, there's a theory that the people that had a, had a good amount of vitamin D already in their body, they were capable of building a pretty good immune response and had a higher um, uh, survivability rate than those that did not. Okay, all right, all right. But that's still, that's still being investigated now. And so if I'm not in a place where I can wash my hands, um, then the hand sanitizers are still something that we need to probably going to be using for the, next, for, the, for the near future, you would say. We, well, you know, to be honest, uh, a lot of the public health measures we're taking right now are things we should have been doing just to prevent influenza spread. Right. So, so, uh, so yeah, I'm, I'm, I, you know, if I walk into certain areas, I'm going to still hand sanitize um, even when we get the pandemic under control. Yeah. Oh, which brings me to another question that I know people come up. There's this this talk about it's it's it can reside on surfaces. So stair uh, handrails on stairs, or if I'm shopping at the grocery store, right? I'm at the register. Um, what what's what what is the research showing on that? Yeah. So there was a very good study that was done where an individual took some of the actual virus and put it on certain surfaces, on an array of different types of surfaces. And and they and they actually did find that the virus can't survive on these virus uh, on the on many surfaces for more than uh, for over a day, uh, two or three days. Uh, the, the shortest time period actually were on metals, especially on uh, copper. Okay. Uh, so if it was on copper, the, it, the survivability of the virus on copper was like four hours. And but we also have to keep in mind that even though when I talk about multiple days, they were measuring. Uh, the degradation, okay, the breakdown of the virus over these days on these on these surfaces. So by day three or four, even though they could still detect some of the virus on there, it was not in a format that would be able to infect an individual. Okay. All right. So 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 we, we still recommend, you know, you know, being careful of surfaces, but if you really look at it after that research came out and then they've gone back and done more epidemiologic surveillance. The CDC has de-emphasized as much worry about about surfaces, but has increased much more about the the uh, aerosolization component. Yes. But however, if you are in a restaurant, for example, and and the aerosol aerosolization falls down on that surface, and you come into it and you touch it right then, and then you go and scratch your face, and it gets somewhere in your nose or even your eyes. Well, that qualifies as you haven't been infected by that surface. So, so it just it's a, as 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 this virus is really showing, timing is so important across an, an enormous of different uh, different things. So, I am in favor of you know people wiping things down that handles at the restaurant. I mean, I'm sorry, the uh, the grocery store. You know, if you go into an area and you put your hands on the handle, I'm very much in favor of washing. But we're not as concerned that you know if you walk into a room that you know, that people have been in, you know, the night before. Well, that, that may not be the, the, the most uh, uh, infectious environment that you have to worry about. Okay. All right. All right. Listen, we have we have been going at this for for quite a while, and uh, I, I I we said we've given so much information, right? So I'm trying to break <laughs> this into bite sized pieces. Um, I am. This is going to actually be replayed. It's, it's, we're recording it as we speak. It's going to be replayed on several various websites. Um, th this is happening on Saturdays, folks, live um, at hovhealth.com and also on Facebook. Um, th I'll be sharing this this video with you for you to put up on your websites and get out to the folks out there in, in Florida. Um, our next session that we're going to do is going to be on vaccinations, on treatments, um, both inpatient, outpatient, um, and really trying to take do another deep dive into that area. Um, because we're doing this live on Facebook, you know, we're able to take questions. So I'm hoping that when you all see these pre-recorded um, session that we just did, then get sign up for Heal in Our Village, um, uh, uh, HOVHealth.com, subscribe to my Facebook, my Instagram. Instagram. And this next time, we want to take questions, right? I'm able to see the questions or the comments as they come through. So I want, I'm encouraging everybody that sees this, this first session. Um, you know, we are, we're here to, we're here for your health. Okay, that's why it's the name of the show. And Dr. Steed, I'm telling you, man, this is the best, this is the best that I have heard. 
that and I've been listening, I must have I've listened to about 20 of these webinars over the last few months um, with, you know, medical experts. But they, you know, pharmacists, this is the difference between pharmacists and everybody else. We tend to get real granular and we take a deep dive. And we're not, we're not in, at the surface here. We always try to really get this stuff down so we know all the little intricacies of stuff because this stuff is, is intricate. There's a lot of moving parts to this. So I just really want to thank you. You're, there's nobody else in the country that knows more about this than you do. I don't care what they say. And um, I really appreciate your time today. I want to encourage you to come back. I want to have you come back. We have to sync your schedule so you can help us out with this whole medication treatment and vaccinations. Uh, yeah, I would, I would very much appreciate the opportunity to come back and, and even take questions. Um, you know, the vaccination component, again, is something I'm spending an enormous amount of time studying and, and, and being able to communicate that back to the public. Uh, when, I, I can assure all of you, uh, we're not going to infect our way out of it. So herd immunity by infecting everybody is a terrible strategy. Terrible. Uh, but, we're, but, but we're not going to be able to regain uh, everything uh, in a way of getting back to work, the economy, getting our children back to school until we get this under control and vaccination offers the best role. And, and, then, and, and there's one, there's one, one more important thing. You've got to give me a moment, just uh, 30 seconds to tell your oh, group, please, uh, please, please. especially, yeah, no, please. It's, it's, especially on the recording. I am particularly concerned and we're going to say this from a, a standpoint of demographic data. Okay. Demographic data. And almost any demographic we're going to talk about, if you can lump people into a demographic, my big fear right now is that if we don't, if we do not vaccinate enough people, the viral pressure will actually fall into the demographic bucket of people who are not vaccinated. Because the virus is not going to go away magically, you know, for, for I mean, it's not going to disappear but it will continue to seek out people who don't have that level of protection. So if we have a particular zip code or a particular people, uh, group of people who are African-American in a particular lo location, well, then the viral pressure is going to fall into that particular group. And so we have to begin to think about why are we trying to vaccinate so many different people in so many different areas? Because as we vaccinate more people, if we get 50% vaccinated, and we start opening up the economy, we start working more, doing more, people are feeling more comfortable. The people who are not protected, well, now they are going to shoulder the burden of that viral pressure. And they are not going to have the protection. And so, you know, I really do hope that, you know, if it's me or another guest that you have come on, that we can really spend time talking about the vaccination effort, what the vaccines are, uh, you know, the, you know the, the messenger RNA uh uh, you know, some of the misinformation that's out there is horrendous, to be perfectly honest. Uh, but we also have to be truthful and honest with many of our people and let them know that these are not perfect. And, and a very small number of people may experience some adverse effects. And we have to be clear about what those are. And, and I have read both the 53-page report from Pfizer and the 53-page report that came from Moderna. And I have every intention on reading the 53-page report that will come from uh, Johnson & Johnson probably in about a two or three week period. Right. I'm going to read all of it, and I will be right here to transmit and give that information back to you, my good friend. Yeah, and I want to I, congratulate you on, let me congratulate you on For Your Health. Uh, this has been a passion, and there is nobody more passionate that I know in the entire country than you, Dr. Coleman. So I just want to congratulate you, and, I'm, and, I, and I consider you uh, a friend, and I'm so honored uh, that, that we're working together on this initiative. Thank you. Thank you. No, I, uh, I, we have got to get the correct information out there. Um, that we need to, you know, Dr. Fauci said we probably need to be at 85% in terms of the number of people that are getting this vaccination. We need, I'd like to be at a hundred percent. All right. We really need to get this thing done and we need to do it quick. That's the other thing. Speed is important yeah. because we don't want yeah. this virus changing and mutating and spreading. We have got to decrease these number of new, I mean, the total new cases every day is ridiculous. Ridiculous, right? And then we're looking at, I mean, I just can't believe that. I mean, I know it's just insane. And 4,000 people dying and all of our ICUs are overburdened. I mean, this is, so, this is an emergency. I, I feel that the new administration sees it as that. So I'm hoping that over the next, you know, four, four to six weeks, we're going to look, things are going to look different. 
so that we can get this thing under better control. So I absolutely agree with you. I, and we're going to be we're going to stay on this topic for your health. We're going to talk about vaccinations and medication treatments the next time around. I'll sync with your schedule to make sure that you come because uh, I'm not sure I'm going to read all 52 pages of all them reports. <laughs> I don't know. I'm going to we'll read see. everything. But uh, I know you will and you're not going to only read them but you're going to know what what it's what it's talking about as well. So yes. thank you again.